is the key ingredient to to being successful with decluttering? We just keep finding more areas of the brain to declutter. For example, uh, pleased to report that after three years, uh, one client has finally accepted payment for her. She's a stained glass artist and she's been considering and well, I'll get to it and humming and hawing and having no confidence. Well, now she finally has the confidence to put herself out there. But I said to her very recently when she was about to accept payment for this, it was $800. Uh, she, now I said, do you think that you could possibly have considered this when we started with your, with your home that was so cluttered, you could barely walk through it? And she said, oh, good Lord, no, no. Greg, I mean, drama schools are amazing and the work that they do, but sometimes what can be missing for some clients is the business side of acting. And sometimes it's just having that awareness from somebody who's actually in the industry already that can help sort of get them prepared and even you know work upon and build upon all that amazing work that drama do, schools do and just to help them when they're coming out into the industry that some of your viewers might think that they could just practice meditation make a couple of other adjustments and the problem will go away use acupuncture you know meditate and use acupuncture and the problem will go away the way i typically explain it is that we have certain processes we might use like just imagine most of us have taken a yoga class and a lot of yoga classes will start with some sort of breathing exercise i in my molt method program i have a breathing exercise that i have incorporated into one of the modules i teach people how to practice because it's super something super easy you can do literally if you're sitting at a stoplight you know uh, my molt method program and um if you have some sort of technique i don't care if you use the one i recommend or you, if you go to yoga class and let's just say you went to yoga class and you know how you feel at the end of yoga class where you're all like zen and totally relaxed and you're thinking oh man i'm i'm like so floating on a cloud this is gonna last for three days right and an hour later, your system's like back on overdrive and you're wired and you're like, man, like, why doesn't it last? Why, why, when I really put in the effort to soothe my nervous system, relax, to reduce stress, it's not lasting. And so there, you know, it is possible that you just have a crazy stressful life, you know, that basically you stepped out of your yoga class, turned your phone back on and got on the phone with somebody who just always knows how to push your buttons. Like that's a, that's not what I'm referring to here. That is a problem, certainly. But if you just find that for like no apparent reason, your system just goes right back to like anxious and um, and feeling that that we know how that stress feels in our body, most of us. Um, if that's happening, then there tends to be some sort of internal stressor that is causing your internal systems, your nervous system in particular, to stay on overdrive. So do you think creativity, you think we're born with it or is it something that we learn? Um, no, I think it's something in, in us. Um, I think there's things in our DNA that we don't even know why certain people do certain things. I think there's a thing about certain people with rhythm or there's a certain thing in people about math or whatever it is. But I think creativity is innate. I think we are more creative at things than other people and that speaks to everybody some people are great at crafting something and don't even know why they're great at crafting things or whatever but i would imagine you probably go back a couple of generations and you're sure your family came from that they were doing that or you heard that all the time and you reacted a certain way to this this rhythm or the, the, the sound, I think that's creative to me because I think a lot of people can have that but don't know it or just don't, they're not in tune with their own creativity that they can do naturally uh, and what that means to people. You could speak to somebody in a certain way and know that you know how your tone is going to affect that person when you speak to, like a father knows, I could use a certain tone to kids and they're going to want to fall in line with me. And it, just instinctively, they're going to know. And I think 
artists do that. Some of them don't even know they're doing it, but some of them have. I think Prince locked in to, he understood, I can sing this song a certain way, and women are going to feel something with this. And I think once he, once he locked into that, which I think would be like in the 1999 time when he understood sonically how I sound, and I'm going to mix that with visually how I look, I will be irresistible to certain people. <laughs> like, and he plays on it his whole career. Like, I want to make the voice and the presentation irresistible. Like, he tapped into it. He's not lucking into he just happens to look a certain way or he's moving a certain way. No, he realized, I see the reaction this is getting. I'm about to fine tune this. And I think each album, he just fine tuned it more every time and switched it up just a little bit. But he knew what you were looking for. And he knew it. He gave off all this energy like, and I know this is getting you. And you know I know you because I'm getting you right now. Like, <laughs> and he sort of throws that playfulness in it. But I think he's just a master of understanding his innate talent, which is why I say music is superpower, because I think people like Prince, Michael, James, uh, Jagger, they, they are like, they, I wouldn't be surprised if they are like uh, coming from something that they don't even understand. Like there was maybe somebody in their family generations ago that was doing the same type of thing it may have been music, but it was in something where they just have a, a something that comes out of them that people respond to. I think Michael Jackson is a perfect example of, of the highest level of that because even my daughter, who was never around when Michael Jackson was famous or he's dead when she was born, she's a Michael Jackson fan. Like she, she just hears the voice and then. It got her, and I noticed when she would see the videos, she'd walk in the room, and she was just enamored. And it took her a second to know that that's the same person because, you know, skin got a little lighter. But when she realized it was the same dude, and he was also that little kid that she sees in some videos, she just, it's just something, I think there's something in his voice that attracts children to just identify. Like, they don't even, they don't know nothing about it, but they can hear one of them songs. And they're into it. Like, oh, oh, this is great. And now she's doing the dancing. And, you know, her favorite song is Bad. Like, wow. She just loves, she likes looking at it. She thinks it's funny in a sense because it's so, yeah. <laughs> it's so incredible. And she's like, you never see stuff like that. And then she's just into the song, like there's something about it. And anytime, I just said humans have the capacity to change, but you have to want to. So in this, you have to want to be different. And it's hard work and it's a practice. So the four R's for us are rest, rejuvenation, realignment, and reconnection. And rest is sleep and like physical rest. I always make the jokes like, I know this is terrible news for everybody, but you do need to sleep. <laughs> like I like spoiler alert. It's, it's hard, but it's also somehow one of the things we're all really bad at. So buy the fancy pillow, get a sleep study done, talk to like, see if melatonin works for you. Like you need sleep. And so if you're not getting it consistently, introducing a practice of sleep is one of the first steps possibly to doing that. But there's other ways to rest. There's other ways, there's other ways to rest, but rest is only one component of burnout prevention, mitigation, and recovery. The other three are the ones we don't hear a lot of other folks talking about. And so one is rejuvenation. You need to do things that bring you joy. Joy and happiness are non-negotiable parts of the human experience. So if I just focused on burnout prevention as like doing rest, yoga, and bubble baths, the way a lot of the internet tells you to do it, I would be missing out on these things that also prevent burnout, which is how do I have fun? Fun, this thing that capitalism tells us we're not supposed to have, is a huge part of remembering who we are as human beings. We're meant, we're allowed, and we're supposed to. Joy is important. Talk us through the law of attraction, because I know it's something you are very good at. You know about it all. So I help us all understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question, Sha. Um, I see. I believe in parallel universes. I believe that whatever is on our minds whatever we can conjure in our mind as a thought is possible already exist 
and the degree to which we can let go of the doubt that it doesn't exist. Because there's so many parts of us, you know, there's so many parts of us, and each part of us has different thoughts, different beliefs, and our beliefs are really our repeated thoughts. And each part of us may share that thought to different degrees. The more we can come to a place where we, can, we, we, we have that thought as a dominant, dominant belief across all our being, across all our parts, the easier it is for us to attract that particular reality into our lives. And by attract, I mean we're jumping. We're jumping into that timeline. Because some of sometimes we think, oh, is there a timeline where I'm earning a million pounds or a million dollars a year? It exists. But the degree to which we can be in that timeline is really dependent on the degree to which we heal, the degree to which we release the limiting beliefs, the degree to which we come to own our self-worth. Self-worth is key. Self-worth allows us to live our dreams without, with audacity, with audacity. The law of attraction requires audacity, you know, because we are asking ourselves to create something from nothing. We're asking ourselves to have faith. And even a little faith can be hard if you're stuck in that place of disbelief, place of fear. The media is carrying, you know, lo lots of misbehavior in the media, I have to say, <laughs> where there is absolutely no room for high self-worth. There is no room for wholesomeness. There is no room for the different parts of us to feel welcome. Because you must be this way. You must be tall. You must be um, you must wear lipstick, you must wear this. And this is about us really accepting ourselves for who we truly are, the diversity of being. And from this place, from this place, we are able to step into whatever and attract whatever we actually desire as unique pieces of infinite intelligence. For so many people, who um, explore the pelvic health journey for themselves, especially in a, like, you know, non-manipulative way. Like, I trained with a physical therapist, and um, I really appreciate the nuance and understanding that there's, like, manipulative work. There's, like, um, like we're going to change what your body is doing, which sometimes is important. And then there's soft touch work, which is, like, just listening and kind of allowing the body to change. I'm on the soft touch side of things. I feel like manipulative work. I'm so sensitive. My sensitivity level is like through the roof. So any type of like, we're going to create change just t tends to like kind of throw me not in a good way. So with the soft touch approach of things, so many people in their public health journey have a kind of um, spiritual awakening or spiritual experience and i really attribute this to the nervous system and one of my favorite spirituality books that i've ever read he said all spiritual experiences are neurological it's different parts of our brain are leading to um you know whatever whether it's visions or memories or ancestral information or soul travel or you know people have all these different languages for how they want to describe but um and i don't really pretend to know what the right language is but i've experienced for myself and so many people i work with have these um very and it can be very dysregulating it can be like um jarring or disturbing it can be like i'm having these images and these quote memories that like i don't think are from me or my lifetime and that for me is one of the most fascinating things about the pelvic health journey is especially working around the ovaries you know our ovaries are little hubs of genetic information they're like these little precious materials of dna and People have these wild um, spiritual kind of awakening 
experiences when they start to work with their ovaries in a very gentle way. And for me, it's all neurological. You know, if you're getting information in your brain, then your brain activity is really responding to what's happening in your cellular memory in your body and in your nerve system. Einstein's theory in relation to the law of relativity. I mean, they're, they're the same as such. Obviously, there's a law, which is a spiritual law, and then there's Einstein's theory of relativity. So as we, well, most people know, Albert Einstein, the German-born physicist, believe that space and time are relative, and they're not absolute concepts. In other words, existing or having its special nature only by relation to something else. So it's not absolute or independent, you know, it's in relation to something else. For example, happiness is relative. Yes. Okay, so happiness is one we can use because... You know, it takes different things to make people happy. So in relation to how they were brought up, so in relation to something else, you know, how people are brought up, what they learned about happiness, how they view happiness, we can all be different in that regard. What makes some people happy may not make somebody else happy. Happiness, it just popped into my head, that one about happiness, but I think it's probably a good one to use, is relative. It's how... Each person sees it. It's not an absolute concept. It's not uh, very specific. It just depends on the person. Also, to relate, it's about linking in with a natural uh, association, being associated. So this then helps to define, to define it as either good or bad or helpful or unhelpful, etc. If you relate your situation to something that appears to be worse then by what I would say is a natural association your situation begins to look better if you do the opposite so if you relate your situation to something that appears to be better then your situation will naturally appear worse probably the most famous example of this would be Shakespeare who uh, in some way, I think summed it up very nicely in one of his <laughs> most popular plays, Hamlet, when he said, "'Tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so." And many people have quoted that, misquoted it <laughs> a lot as well. Uh, but we, you, we often refer to that saying, that beautiful piece of literature, a beautiful piece of uh, strung together words by Shakespeare as whatever the situation is, we will all see it, see it depending on our way of thinking, how we think and see and process things. So thinking makes it so. So nothing's either good or bad. It's how you think about it, how you see it, how you perceive it. And our way of thinking about something is usually in relation to our way of thinking about something else. So here we go back to the not absolute, it's in relation to something else. And I hope you're still with me on this, because, you know, spiritual laws, we people often think that spirituality is woo-woo, it's out of the ordinary, it's, you know, out of space, it's aliens, it's... um flippy floppy it's transparent and see-through it's not solid or concrete and really I suppose a lot of that is a magical thinking as such and it's um folklore as such you know we have images of what we believe spirituality is all about or is but that's in relation to something else to what we think what we feel, how we, we are, what makes it so. It's all linked. It's all linked to memory, conditioning, and something I often repeat, belief systems. If you listen to any of my podcasts, you will hear me often say, this is my belief system. This is how I believe. This is what I believe to be. Because we all have a belief system. And I'm the first to say I can change that based upon my learning. So some things for me are quite solid, uh, and then some things for me can shift 
because I've obtained but through something else, uh, either a person or something I've read or research, it's usually research for me, uh, that's something that I've come across, something that I believe that will alter or support, will support that belief system in a way that becomes more flexible so that I can move it around. Still a foundation of me in it, that's the relation to me, but it can change. And so we have a conundrum, really. I mean, how do we relate to something differently if we already have a memory bank of how to relate? How do we change that way in which we relate if the memory bank is there? And so some people like to refer to our brains as computers. I can see this similarity, but of course, they are indeed very different, of course. You know, the fundamental aspect being that you can wipe a computer clean, can't you? You can, and many people have, you know, really, it's ruined their day where something disappeared, where the screen went blank. When computers first came around, and I'm sounding really ancient here, but when they really got going, you know, even before the internet, before dial-up and all that, um, it was still, you could just lose anything and that it, that's it, it would be gone. Um, and then you'd have to start from scratch. The human brain, okay, there are some ways in which that can falter. And so, as we know, we have different medical conditions like um, stroke, you know, brain injury, acquired brain injury, different things, amnesia, dementia, there are things that can alter our memory. Computers are subject to electromagnetic field and like us, often become overloaded, uh, break down, sick, they stop working, they're temperamental, they're slow, they're fast, they get viruses, you know, that's a hot topic at the moment. They stay up too late, you know, computers, you leave them on and something can happen. They're overworked, you know, you try and, sometimes you try and type, if you, you, if you really type really quickly, I know, I don't know if some of you have noticed this, but I've spoken to people, sometimes the computer can't keep up, you know, it really can't. It, something will happen. But the law of relativity suggests that all of these components depend on how we see things, which is how I open this whole talk. If we see our computers as the only thing in our lives that fulfill us, which is a big problem at the moment, as we know, then we're looking at a machine to give us what a human being could give us. Thank you for joining me today. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment and share the video on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow on your favorite social media platform. See you soon.